Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. I'm really excited for our conversation today. We have an absolutely fantastic guest. Christian Catalini is the co-founder and chief strategy officer of LightSpark, as well as a founder of the MIT Crypto Economics Lab. And he's got a really interesting career across both blockchain and academic backgrounds. So with that, Christian, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. The pleasure is mine. How do you define yourself? Are you a scientist, an economist, an entrepreneur? What do you think is the core of what you do? These days, I love to think of myself as a builder, trying to build new things. What is a builder? You know, an entrepreneur trying to recombine some of the ideas in this space, especially in crypto, and trying to make them useful to the many more people that I think are in, in big need for them. What kind of research or focus did you have at the beginning of your career? Actually, I came to crypto through kind of a bit of a detour from crowdfunding. Back when I was doing my doctoral studies in Toronto, I stumbled upon a platform that was kind of the early, the early start of what later became the crowdfunding and equity crowdfunding movement. It was a small platform in the Netherlands that nobody remembers these days. Actually, it sold, I think, at some point for one euro called Salaband. What they were doing was not that different than what some are trying today in the Web3 space. The founder actually had worked at Sony for many, many years. He realized that artists needed you know, a better solution for monetizing their work. So he, he left Sony and he founded a company where artists could essentially record their own music and then they would share royalties with the audience, with the fans that would discover them early on. I was fascinated by how technology through crowdfunding could really democratize access you know, to capital in this case. And so I went down the crowdfunding rabbit hole. We ended up writing the first economics paper on crowdfunding. I still remember the economics audience being pretty puzzled by what we were describing as the future of you know, how people would fund their, their creative endeavors. And for many years, people were really skeptical of crowdfunding, the same way they, they were later skeptical of crypto. That led me early on to Bitcoin. And at the time, my advisor was like, okay, you already have enough going on with this crowdfunding work. Don't jump into this, this crypto. It seems, even, it's, it seems even weirder. Just get a job first, which I did. So I started at MIT, and, and my first year on the job is actually when we designed the MIT Bitcoin experiment. So I went back to, to Bitcoin at that time with time and resources to, to really start studying it. And so became one of the early academics looking at the economics of Bitcoin and then, you know, of cryptocurrencies in general. Can we explore a bit the overlap between the academic world when you joined, you know, in the early 2010s and entrepreneurship and Bitcoin and crowdfunding? What's the relationship between the research approach and, you know, thinking about problems deeply and rigorously and the world of building and doing and potentially breaking things and creating solutions. Like, can you talk about what you saw and the tensions that you encountered? It's actually closer than you may think in a number of ways. So at MIT, I was teaching the core entrepreneurship classes. So I would see on, on average, you know, from 50 to 100 startups each year. And so that would keep me really close to the technological frontier. And MIT is always buzzing with a number of different ideas that are typically science intensive, whether it's computer science, AI, crypto, and alike. And then you have a number of students, including MBAs, that want to take their ideas and, and really bring them to life. And that recombination between kind of business-oriented people and more science-oriented people is where kind of often the magic happens. So part of my exposure to, to entrepreneurship was early on, even during my doctoral studies. Through that, I helped design a program called the Creative Destruction Lab in Toronto, which you know, later created billions of dollars of equity value at the intersection of academia and, and startups. On the research front, 
again, often when a sector is new, the only people looking at it are the, you know, the cypherpunks in the case of crypto, some early computer scientists and, and academics. Academics are often drawn to, you know, whatever, whatever is novel, strange and, and potentially transformational. That's what drew me to, to crypto early on. I looked at it and said, okay, if this works, it's going to change everything. It's going to change how we do payments. It's going to change how we do financial services. It's going to change how you know, someone in, in Africa, Asia, or Latin America can finally be fully connected to the rest of the financial system. So I started looking into it, and I was very naive, right? I imagined, okay, this is going to happen really rapidly. When we designed the Bitcoin experiment in 2013 and then, you know, dropped what was at the time about half a million dollar in Bitcoin to all of the MIT undergrads, which smart enough, you know, all, the vast majority of them kept their Bitcoin, which is not worth a, a lot more than that. I imagine Bitcoin and everything around it changing how people do banking and payments, you know, in the span of a few years. Technology is often very fast. And so I expected the same from, from crypto. But as, as you know, we're 10 years into that journey, and it's still going to take a lot of work for crypto to be truly useful to regular people, regular businesses, and everyone else. Absolutely. And I think the value proposition of blockchain and, and Bitcoin and crypto as a financial infrastructure, to me and to many others, has been clear and obvious for years and is painfully clear and obvious with every single year in which it performs well. I want to spend just a bit more time on the practices that you've developed and brought to your students and to the markets and so on. And I'm really interested in the story of the Creative Destruction Lab, the story of the MIT Crypto Economics Lab. What is a lab? How does it work in this context? Because this isn't necessarily a science. It's a, maybe it's a social science of, of economics, but, you know, business is pretty far away from the, the physics of the world. So what does it mean to build a lab? And then what did the participants do in these environments that you've created? Yeah, so the, the founder of the Creative Distraction Lab, Jay Agraval, had this idea. Out of Toronto, so Canada does not have the same level of entrepreneur activity as, say, you know, Silicon Valley or, or, or some, some other geographic hubs, but it has a lot of technical talent. And so his realization was... If we can connect some of the best students, graduate students, postdocs, PhDs, professors at the University of Toronto and other academic institutions to people that know how to build and scale startups and have done it before, can give them the right mentorship and advice. Now we have a lab where ideas can collide and through those serendipitous interactions and conversations, if you structure it right, you can start, start commercializing and bringing to life a lot more technology and ideas that would otherwise stay in the ivory tower. So CDL was really an effort at you know, helping people with bright ideas think big and, and scale them up, whether it requires capital, requires mentorship, it requires everything else. Very different than a traditional accelerator where, again, there, there are certain types of incentives. It was really driven by, by the idea that those connections could transform into real companies. And, and, and I think the track record of CDL proves that. With the Crypto Economics Lab, the effort was slightly different. So I think at, at MIT, we realized with Katrin Tucker, the, the other co-founder of the lab, that there was too much skepticism about crypto coming from every single sector, whether it's computer science or even economics. And so we needed a place for people that were interested in pushing the boundaries of that, that research and that technology to sort of be safe and experiment. So we raised some funding from alumni that were interested in, in, in crypto, and we funded doctoral students, PhDs, postdocs that wanted to do more research on it. That's also how eventually you know, I, I got in touch with David, David Marcos, who at the time was at Facebook leading Messenger, as he was starting to put together kind of the early team of what later became Libra. But the scope of the lab was really just advancing research and, and allowing people that were passionate about crypto believed that it could really change people's lives to advance research that later could be commercially useful or at least inspire policymakers, regulators to look at this space from, from a different light rather than you know the skepticism that it was wrapped into all the way back to 2013 when we did the Bitcoin experiment. I still remember, first of all, the MIT administration did not want the students that had raised the funding from the 
donors to distribute it to their peers. They said it was too dangerous to give everybody Bitcoin. These were the days where the headlines were about Silk Road and all sort of like, you know, illicit activity uh, being powered by cryptocurrencies. But by us designing that science experiment behind it, we were able to still do it, learn something. And I think expose, at the time, it was about 5,000 students to crypto. Now, I know anecdotally that many of those MIT students ended up founding companies, working in crypto, and really building some of the pieces of the future, which I think was a lot more important than just get, handing them, you know, at, at the time, uh, I think about uh, about a third of a Bitcoin, which, you know, some some have sold for a very expensive sushi lunch in, in Kendall Square or Central Square, a few of the places where you could spend Bitcoin back in 2014. One side of your focus has been in the university world and tapping into the talent pools there, but then you've also been very active on the commercial side as well. You had mentioned Libra. How did that come together and what was it? Back in the day, I think David had been also, you know, really aware of everything happening in crypto for many years. When when I got in touch with David and and, and kind of the the early people at, at Facebook that were interested in this, the code name for the project again was Libra, which then eventually became its actual public name, was to use some of the technology to really give everybody open access to a network for global payments, starting with remittances, which you know at the time and even today are still way too expensive. And and realizing that if we can make money movement as simple as as messaging at the time, uh, and now with Uma, we're actually thinking of this in, in a slightly different way, as simple as sending an email, you could really transform people's lives. A lot of people rely and depend on the money that family and friends send them from, from abroad. That's a need that wasn't filled in 2017 and then 18 when kind of the Libra project came together. And that's a need that even today, in 2024, it's still not filled. So again, a lot of time has passed. There's been a lot of experimentation in crypto. But I think if you look back, we still need a truly open protocol for moving money on the internet. How, how, do we, how do we connect people more seamlessly when they want to exchange value? There's still too much of a high tax when you're trying to move money rather than just you know information. Thinking more about the DM experiment, your role was in part the economic design of it. There's been quite a bit of impact from Libra, aside from just taking the regulatory brunt and attack of you know the US government and distracting everybody while other networks grew. There's been lots of follow-up value creation from Aptos to Sui to open networks like Open Libra, and these have created billions in value. But in that moment of inception, can you talk about your approach to designing the economic structure of the network? And I'm interested in both the outcome, like the thing that is rendered, but also the process. Like what are the elements of even coming up with the parts of the network that make sense? Yes, unlike you know some of the other white papers of that same era, we had a very precise mission and objective. We wanted to make it extremely simple for people to send remittances uh, cross border, and so from an economics perspective, we needed an instrument and a vehicle for that that was safe, stable, and sound. That led actually to the original design of which I you know I take full blame of the the Libra basket. So essentially, a blend of different currencies that could retain value when you're trying to send money cross-border. Now, often, I, I think the basket was misunderstood. There was no major ambition of making it a unit of account. The reason why it was a blend was because we wanted actually to ensure that no matter where you were on the globe, if somebody was sending you a remittance and money over Libra, you could retain most of the value. And so something that is, say, a dollar-denominated stablecoin is not enough, or something that is even a euro or pound-denominated stablecoin is not enough, because different regions have different exposures to different currencies. So that's where the, the idea for the basket came from. Of course, as you as you well know, it wasn't really well received. People saw it as a threat to sovereignty, which definitely wasn't. In fact, it was designed to work seamlessly with other currencies. And in the future evolution from that original design, we actually switched to a system of single currency stablecoins so that you could have you know, Libra dollar, Libra euro, Libra pound. But the idea was fundamentally the same. How do we make money movement between borders as seamless as, as, as again, sending a text message or sending an email? 
there were a number of considerations that are still relevant and important today for stablecoin issuers, which were if you're trying to you know, allow people to move value, but also store value, you need to expose them to something that is as safe and sound as possible. So we spent a lot of cycles actually on the design of the reserve. And in fact, uh, I, I would say as evidenced by some of the reports by the Fed on the same topic, the Libra design is, is pretty become the gold standard of how all the central banks are thinking about robust stablecoin design. A reserve of high quality liquid assets that can be redeemed on demand in any market condition. Not, not, not like what we've seen actually in the past where, you know, issuers have had to stop redemptions and have had drops in their value, have depegged. These are all challenges that I think we know how to solve. And in fact, you know, that's part of the Libra open source code and, and a documentation. And I invite anyone in the industry to look back at what we kind of discovered there and implement it because I think that will lead to safer stable coins and to better instruments that people can use on crypto rails. Again, from an economics perspective, there are a number of areas that we explored. Stability was, was one that was really, really important to us because if you think about a network of 3 billion people, you have a massive responsibility to deliver the best possible solution out there. And we work closely actually with regulators uh, across the globe in refining and improving that design. I think it goes to show that stable coins can add value into this ecosystem, but they need to be designed in, in the right way. Can you expand on on the point around depegging? And you know, I'm not sure if you're referring to USDC depegging or something else. There's been a number of events. I would say the most catastrophic one that everybody is aware of, of course, is the Terra Luna one. Algorithmic stable coins, which we considered right back in 2017, 18, from a design perspective. Our conclusion at, at at the time, and maybe again, we weren't we weren't clever enough, was that there there was no solution to the algorithmic stablecoin problem, and, and and so any algorithmic stablecoins would inevitably at some point face a debt spiral, and so as a result, we were not comfortable designing anything that implemented algorithmic concepts into into its design. It is very hard to you know to to cheat the laws of physics, and when it comes to economics and, and algorithmic stablecoins, the laws of physics are that these instruments are very hard to stabilize over the, over the long haul. You've seen the pegging events also in fiat backed stablecoins, and that speaks more to is the reserve designed properly? If a large part of your holdings are held with a bank or a small number of banks, of course, you, you have credit risk against that bank, which is what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, right? When Silicon Valley Bank went through its process of receivership and was kind of rescued, of course, the assets that some stablecoins holders add with that bank were potentially not available or even lost. Now, the, it all worked out well in this particular instance, and you know the stablecoin issuers were able to recover and repeg, but you've seen a depegging event that was about 8%. Just for context, when money market funds depagged and kind of broke the buck, that was for a few cents. I think it was about three cents. Stablecoins, you know, depegged way more than that historically. And so this is all to say that we have yet to see properly designed stablecoins that can reach scale and be extremely useful to society. So hopefully that's something that 2024 will bring. And maybe there'll be new issuers that will take into account some of the things we learned with Libra and bring them to the market. Some of the clear lessons are, you know, diversification of underlying institutions as well as to have underlying collateral. Is your view that stable coins should be 100% collateralized, over collateralized? And then from a counterparty risk perspective, you know, is there a sweet spot of the number of institutions that should be in a consortium? The reality of it is that, you know, ideally, if you're designing something that's meant to be a medium of exchange and it's used for payments, you're collateralizing it with high-quality liquid assets. So in the case of a dollar-denominated stablecoins, it is U.S. Treasuries short-term, so 90 days or less. Then you can have de minimis cash to manage liquidity and maybe reverse repos for, again, intraday liquidity. But fundamentally, you should be holding an asset that is as close to the, the asset that people are, believe they're holding, which is a dollar, as possible. If you follow that design, you can go wrong. But that also doesn't include things like money market funds or other wrappers around the reserve as the ones we've seen in the market today. So again, I, I think if we're thinking about stablecoins as almost like narrow banks, then the best design is still the one where you're backing everything with high quality liquid assets, short-term treasuries, and that's it. 
that reduces the risk for consumers and businesses. To date, there's a small subset of stablecoins that follow somewhat that model. And definitely some of the largest ones have not implemented it yet. Some rely on money market funds. And when you rely on money market funds, that money market funds can levy gates and fees in a crisis. So that means that if there was a major crisis, consumers may not be able to get back you know, the full dollar amount. So they may get a haircut on, on that value. Again, this is all to say that I think the space is promising, but we still need more developments for stablecoins to be truly safe and sound. I want to thread the needle on a somewhat tricky question, which I would guess came out from your experience with designing Diem, and in particular, the governance of something like the Diem Association. You've also been involved with projects around central bank digital currency, as well as, of course, LightSpark being a company that's built in a deep way around Bitcoin. And there are quite different philosophical as well as governance principles for these different assets, for stable coins, for central bank digital currencies, for Bitcoin, where, you know, in the one case, you would have an asset that is maximally decentralized, where entry and exit is unimpeded or, you know, free, mathematically governed to the more severe extreme of sovereign issuance and very tight control around who and how can issue and and manage supply to something like the Diem Association with a group of private actors that look like corporations that might have profit interests and are tied together through some articles through which they collaborate. Can you talk about that layer of governance and responsibility you know, and I guess the core of the question is somebody's responsible for the money end of the day. What are the successful ways or what are the proven ways of being responsible for the money and what are the forms that you've engaged in? I mean, the short answer is that when we went back to the drawing board and, and found that LightSpark, we immediately landed on Bitcoin. After the entire experience of Libra and then DM. And you know, countless regulatory interactions across the globe, it became very clear to us that it's extremely, extremely difficult to set up the proper governance and make it credible, even if you have, when it comes to a payment network or, or kind of a blockchain ecosystem. To date, you know, I, I think there's a very small number of blockchains, and, and in fact, you know, probably the, the, the number is one or two, that can claim that they actually have decentralized governance. Bitcoin is definitely one of them. Can I ask you to define what governance is? It really depends on what you're trying to do, right? So when it comes to Bitcoin governance, you have, of course, the open source process around core developers and contributions and upgrade to the system. But you know, if you zoom out, is, is the subset of who can influence the tra trajectory and the evolution of the ecosystem. With Libra, we always face this challenge, no matter how much we, we wrote articles and bylaws and had a true democratic governance with one vote, you know, one member. And it wasn't just corporation, right? So you had NGOs, you had nonprofits, you had a number of different constituents with different ideas, academic institutions. But with Libra, there was always this concern that regardless of the governance, if things were to change by some of the larger participants in the ecosystem, they could change for everyone. And so people did not trust Libra in the same way that I think they trust a truly open, permissionless network with true track record of decentralized governance like Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a number of, you know, flaws. It's not the best technological solution. And in fact, you know, the DM code base and open source code base has been used by many projects after us. We explicitly decided to not take that open source code base because it's extremely difficult to launch a new network in this space and make it credible from a governance perspective. As it turns out, if I were to really summarize 10 years of you know, crypto research and learnings, I would say that my most profound conviction and conclusion is that in crypto, a blockchain and things like Bitcoin are not so much a technological innovation as much as they're an institutional and governance innovation. And if you believe that, then it becomes really clear that it doesn't matter if a network has more transaction per second or more programmability or advanced features. 
it's not going to matter if what matters is that you can truly trust it and use it without worrying about you know anyone influencing its its direction. And so with Bitcoin, we have that. I think other networks are getting close to that. They have scale, they have developers, but many have a single institution, individual, or set of stakeholders that can drastically influence that trajectory. And so as a result, they end up not being that different than the wallet gardens that this technology is meant to replace. That's the challenge also with stable coins, right? You always have a single issuer, especially if it's a fiat-backed stable coin, you by design have someone, an entity, that can decide winners and losers, that can reallocate rents as the market grows and is successful. With UMA, we made the explicit decision of designing a system that's fully open and an open source and an open standard. It's a system where everybody can join and participate and no one can extirpate your value unilaterally, which we think is extremely, extremely important. And it's why we're building on Bitcoin. I'm not sure this is a good or useful question, but would you say that money is a public good? Money definitely has features of a public good, and there's many different forms of money over history and over time and at the same time in society. So what is not potentially money for us here in the United States, where we have access to banking, financial services, all sorts of options for payments, can be money for someone that doesn't have a good central bank. And so although Bitcoin, again, is imperfect, it turns out that a little bit, you know, paraphrasing the, the Churchill quote on democracy, it might be the best solution we have after you've tried everything else. So in, in many countries and regions of the globe, Bitcoin provides a really interesting set of rails, a really important network that keeps you connected to everyone on the globe, and a new type of digital asset that has special properties that didn't exist, whether from an economics perspective or technological one before. There's nothing else in crypto that gets even close to, to that concept. And, and, and again, if you were to design Bitcoin from scratch today, you probably would do it differently. You would have advanced programming and all the things that we built, again, back in the day for Libra DM in, in, in our code base. But it doesn't matter because what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin, it's, u- it's unique history, the way it has evolved, the way that the governance has kind of organically grown rather than being you know, dictated or decided by a foundation or an association or you name it. I think there are probably other technological things that will over time be seen as as public goods, including access to computing, access to the internet, programmability, all of these things. But staying with digital money and digital assets, do we have other examples where public goods were protected or shepherded by the community at large rather than by a single sovereign actor. And I'm trying to get at this question in part because people use the word public good often in crypto. And, you know, it has kind of this like aspirational protected status. And there are a lot of public goods in the regular world, whether it's the rivers and oceans or whether it's nature or whether it's the air we breathe. But very often the way that you end up protecting those public goods isn't by empowering the individual. It's by individuals delegating their power into a sovereign, which then enforces policy and rights around the protection of that. And I'm trying to analogize it to thinking about a world where money is extranational, you know, where Bitcoin is not a trillion in assets, but a hundred trillion in value and where it is at the scale. Many of us in the industry today believe it will be, you know, do we have other examples of the type of coordination that we're seeing around digital assets that we can analogize to or draw inspiration from? That is a really good question. So first of all, I I don't envision a future where, you know, Bitcoin would replace every form of money. It will be a complement to some forms of money and fiat money will likely play a role for the foreseeable future because it has completely different properties than Bitcoin. At the same time, especially when you're moving value across borders and between different countries, that's where Bitcoin is likely to play a major role, as well and in countries and places where you don't have good institutions and now you do have access to, to sound money. But to your question about, you know, and we've seen this before, it is really a byproduct of the internet. And so I would say the early examples of a community providing what is essentially a major public good are things like the Linux software, right? So in a world where you add proprietary software at scale, suddenly Torvalds, 
put together an army of you know computer scientists and developers and and passionate thinkers to essentially build what is the foundation of a lot of software today. A lot of software in devices and and other parts of networks runs on open source operating systems. That all happened in a decentralized fashion with very light governance. Of course, there was a phase where you know there was kind of a benevolent dictator on, on, on some of those contributions, but eventually became a very decentralized process, very much with Bitcoin. Satoshi, of course, at the beginning was the benevolent dictator of Bitcoin and then eventually relinquished it to the public. Wikipedia, similar story, right? In a world where you had Encyclopedia Britannica and Encarta or you know, a, a few of those, knowledge was provided privately. And suddenly some people on the internet started creating what is today the main source for accurate you know, information, Wikipedia. It's a public good. It's maintained by admins, moderators, and many others, donations. Crypto is not that different. And I'd love your, your hint at different types of public goods that crypto will provide over time, right? So with Bitcoin, of course, you have money. With Ethereum, you have compute. And I'm sure there's going to be more. The old decentralized infrastructure movement is going to bring us maybe decentralized telecommunication networks and other resources will be provided potentially in novel ways. Now, will this completely replace the, the current solutions for it? Unlikely, at least in the near term. But it is a new model where, you know, even if you take creators, going back to the example of crowdfunding, creators today through crypto will be able to not only monetize their work and, and really engage with their audience more directly, but eventually we'll be able to build those audiences and engage with them through new platforms and new forms of aggregation. So there's a lot that the technology will bring. I think people always underestimate how long it's going to take. And so I think payments and crypto, the time is really now and everything is kind of set in place for that to actually happen. The next waves, whether it's Web3 or DeFi, are going to take probably another five to 10 years, as we've seen so far you know, with, with early crypto experiments. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you for that. I think there's probably one more thing that will be a public good powered by the magic forces of the internet, and that's going to be open source artificial intelligence, but it might take us a little bit of time to get there. Absolutely. I, I mean, the intersection of crypto and AI is, is a really fascinating one. And I don't, I don't think we talk enough about how complementary the two technologies actually are, right? So people got excited about AI after the, the chat GPT explosion in, in interest in, in, in users. But all of these models really present major challenges for verification, authenticity, identity. And ironically, we do have a technology that allows you to trust but verify things, and that is that is crypto. So again, it's going to start with payments, but I, I see a really bright future for everyone experimenting on how to bridge between crypto and, and everything else that we do on a daily basis on the internet. I think it's not until people see the, the cost much more explicitly in the way that we have seen the cost of social media over time. I think not until we see the cost of centralized AI and the choke points that it creates, will people really understand how important it is to lean into the open source nature of technology and, and attempt to, to turn it into something much more akin to a network that everybody owns, especially with sort of the asymmetries you can create through the machine productivity that's coming. But that's another rabbit hole. I'd love to switch to LightSpark and understand a bit better what you're working on now and the key components that you're building. When we've wrapped up the Libra and DM journey, we, we had a deep sense of unfinished business. We looked around and of course we had failed, but so, so had everyone else, or at least there, there was no project at scale that could allow you to, to really move value seamlessly between any two countries, any two individuals, 24-7 in real time, all over the globe. So we, we looked at everything we, we kind of did wrong the first time, and we concluded that the only way that you can build a network that is truly global, truly accessible, has to be on, on Bitcoin, uh, as we already discussed. But that immediately presented two set of challenges. The first one was technical, and to be honest, probably not the hardest one, which is how do you get Bitcoin and, and Lightning to really perform? There had been a lot of interest in Lightning, and in fact, Taj, one of my colleagues here at LightSpark, wrote you know, the, the, the white paper, the original set of ideas behind Lightning. But after that, Lightning never really scaled. And there were a number of good technological reasons for why that was the case. And you know, with some of the best engineers in the industry, we set ourselves to, to solve those. 
that was the, the first set of challenges. And you know, when you have bright engineers, those those can be easily solved. The second set of challenges, though, was was a little bit harder. It had to do with really the economic efficiency of Lightning. For those of you not familiar with Lightning, in Lightning, y- you kind of inherit all the safety and security assumptions of Bitcoin. So if you trust Bitcoin, it's easy to trust Lightning. There's no additional set of validators, no sidechain, no other staking system. It's simple and clean. But as a, as a result of that, you're locking Bitcoin liquidity into pairwise channels. So it works a little bit like correspondent banking, where you have all these pairwise relationships between different nodes on the Lightning Network. But then, because you have a graph, you can move value through those nodes seamlessly in real time, as if you were connected to everybody else. It's great from an experience perspective, but it's extremely costly from an economics perspective. And that's when we really realized that LightSpark had to be as much of an AI ML company, as much of a crypto and payments company. So one of our early products, which is called LightSpark Predict, is essentially optimized for making Lightning really cost efficient. So that now you can use this network that is safe, decentralized, open source, in the same way that you would use a traditional payments API. You don't have to worry about the complexity under the hood. That's why we have our fancy AI and ML models to find you the best routes through that graph to make sure that your payments are fast and efficient and that you don't have to lock a lot of Bitcoin to get the job done. So that was kind of the first phase of LightSpark, really getting Lightning to be enterprise grade, to work out of the box, to be simple to use. And of course, to be capital efficient and and low cost. The second one, the second phase was really about now that we, we can use Lightning, how do we make it more usable? How do we make it simpler? How do we make it compliant so that, you know, broader participants that may be coming from fintech or different wallets in banking and others can start using this network even if they haven't touched crypto before? And that's kind of what we embarked on with UMA, which again is is an open source standard that stands for universal money addresses. What we're doing now is is really bringing Lightning and UMA to different endpoints so that they can start moving value across the globe in real time with low friction, with low cost. So let's unpack a couple of these concepts and let's just start with universal money addresses. What are they? So they build on a number of open source efforts in the Lightning space, Lightning addresses and LNURL. They add a few things that we discovered were really needed by a number of different types of businesses. The first one is something as intuitive and standard as, you know, dollar lex at, you know, wallet.com or whatever your provider might be as a simple way for me to send and receive money from you. So the, the first set of challenges that UMA solves is about usability. Can we make the UI and UX of crypto extremely simple so that people that don't know anything about crypto can use this? The second building block of UMA has to do with FX or conversions. So most people will be still sending value from, say, dollars to Mexican pesos. They don't need to know that the way we deliver 24-7 money movement globally is by going through Bitcoin. And the Bitcoin network, right? So they may not want to hold any Bitcoin. They may have dollars in their wallet in the US and they may want to send funds to family and friends in in Mexico. So UMA makes that conversion between dollars and Mexican pesos seamless. So people can get a very nice exchange rate quote. They can see transparently all the fees involved. And that money can move seamlessly between the US and Mexico any time of the day, any day of the year, 24-7 in real time with no friction. This doesn't exist today, right? So you can do it within the same app or maybe within the same bank, but you cannot do it between different entities that maybe don't don't, don't belong to the same family. In fact, even today, you can send value between, say, PayPal and Venmo, even if they're owned by the same company. Even less so between, say, PayPal and, and the Cash App, right? Which are different companies. And the last piece that's really important in UMA is that we realize that for crypto to really break into the mainstream, it needs to be compliant. So you need to be able to support, if I'm a bank and I want to use this new type of network to move value seamlessly, I need to meet all my regulatory and compliance obligations. And so we extended the protocol. And again, this is an opt-in protocol that people can, can implement open source so that if a bank, say, in Latin America needs to send value to a bank in Europe, before that transfer even happens, they can exchange all the relevant information so they can they can meet all their, their obligations. 
So now suddenly they have a new type of network, whether they're a bank, a wallet, a crypto exchange, or a new type of app to move value seamlessly between borders. Bitcoin is kind of the underlying global settlement asset. That's why the network can be available 24-7. It also allows for final settlement, right? So Bitcoin can be moved over lightning in a final way instantaneously, which doesn't exist with even systems like Swift, which are mostly messaging systems, and then the value has to move later on with delays. When you put that all together, now you have a network where anyone can join. You don't need to be on Lightspark to, to use UMA. Of course, we support enterprise customers with UMA, but UMA is open source. So anyone can connect to the network and start sending value to and from anyone else that supports the standard. It, it, it's kind of a very simple set of you know pieces from a software perspective, but they were really missing. And we think once you put them together, people will be able to build completely new payments experiences, completely new types of software that we're really excited about to see over the next few months. Congratulations. I mean, sometimes when you make things simple, it requires the most amount of work because you are making all of the choices for for what you're not doing and cutting away all of the complexity and the options that people love to attach to what should be a straightforward process. I'm reminded a bit of the Ethereum name service, you know, ENS domains, as well as the concepts behind what was supposed to be the, you know, the Ripple network and XRP as a settlement currency. Is it right to say that one way to think about it is using the Bitcoin asset as kind of the the liquidity pool or as the translation layer for various currencies. And then on top of that, having things akin to a username, but in a very particular format that is standardized and more familiar to people. You described it perfectly. And look, the important things to consider of why Bitcoin for something like UMA over, you know, some of the alternatives are simple. So Bitcoin has the most regulatory clarity across the globe. As we're recording this, we're probably on the verge of the Bitcoin ETF being approved in the in the United States. So again, there's going to be more confirmation of Bitcoin being kind of the, the, the first and leading asset globally when it comes to, to crypto. Second, it has global liquidity. So the spreads between Bitcoin and any fiat currency or any other crypto are actually the tightest. And they're an order of magnitude often smaller than going from, say, a stablecoin to fiat or from any other asset to fiat, including some of the ones you mentioned. And so when you, when you put those pieces together, what UMA can really do is really make Bitcoin useful almost a, as a global version. For those of you familiar with, with Brazil, with PIX, or India with UPI, a global version of PIX. In PIX, every Brazilian essentially got a very simple address that could allow them to send money to each other 24-7. With UMA, what we're doing is providing that same capability on an open network to everyone globally. You mentioned ENS. What's actually interesting is that you could technically write in an ENS record what your UMA is. And so these are not competing systems. And in fact, in the future, I would imagine eventually you'll be able to record your UMA into your ENS and use it directly in that way. So again, there's a lot of possibilities that this evolves. Right now, we're really laser focused on making this useful for cross-border money movement. But if you look at even back in the, in, in the Libra journey, there were a number of digital platforms that struggle with money movement globally. Typically because that money movement is many to many, right? So you have a creator or, or, or an artist that has a very distributed global audience. And so maybe they're receiving tips or subscriptions or value in different forms from many people scattered across the globe. It could be small payments, could be larger payments, and they're located anywhere. So that many to many global money movement has not been solved. And so as you can think of UMA, it's really important to consider that once we unlock this for cross-border money movement, it's going to be a lot more useful for all these digital platforms that to date still leave a lot of value on the table to the traditional legacy payment rails. Fascinating. I, I do think that a lot of the ideas that have been pioneered by various blockchains and different projects, all the stuff that's good is converging and it's being integrated into market leaders, you know, so whether it's the concept of the internet of blockchains or whether it's the concept of layer ones and layer twos, 
or whether it's the idea of stable coins, or whether it's the idea of persistent usernames or identity. I think these ideas will find a place on every chain that has liquidity. And I find your point about the tightest spreads to traditional fiat currency is really interesting and powerful because the value proposition, at least in the payments world, right, is yes, it's reaching every part of the globe and being final and quick and all of those things. It's cost as well. And the larger the asset and the deeper the liquidity around the asset, the lower the cost to transact in that asset. And so you have a natural network effect that if more people use a particular thing, it becomes more economic. Now, that's not necessarily true for you know congestion pricing on the native chain, but at the edges where you on an off-ramp between the digital asset and traditional asset, I do think that's true. Let me ask you a final question around the on and off ramps, because a lot can be done on chain within the modern environment, but in large part, you're still constrained by how to exit out into the real world, right? So I assume if you're ascending something from the US to Mexico, from India to Singapore, you know, through the Lightning Network, end of the day, there's the internet abstraction layer. And on the internet abstraction layer, you have an account, and then you have another account, and things go from, you know, point A to point B. And maybe the physical humans that have access to those accounts reside in different geographies. But end of the day, things are kind of still moving around in one network. The tricky part is getting that stuff off into the traditional wallet, the bank account, and so on. And you've talked about the regulatory de-risking a bit, but I'm curious as to how you're approaching this point of kind of coming in and getting off the network. Because I think for the cross-border story to be true and to really be able to do international payments in the way that you describe, you have to have you know completely smooth experiences within the local geographies where you're trying to use the money. And that's essentially where all the UMA partners come into the picture. Often people say that, look, in the first 10 years of crypto, nothing was done beyond a lot of speculation and, and, and Ponzi's. But if you look, actually, we deployed all across the globe infrastructure that can do exactly that that can cross between digital assets and payment rails, banking rails domestically. Typically, it's in the form of crypto exchanges in each jurisdiction or wallets. They've spent years fine-tuning that on and off ramp and making it cheaper, more effective, faster in their own countries. And so now with UMA, what we're doing is we're connecting them all together. So for example, you have Ripio in LATAM. You have Foxbit in Brazil, Bitnob covering a number of countries in Africa, Coins.ph in the Philippines with over 18 million users. You have Zero Ash and Backed in the United States. You have Xapo Bank in Europe. All of these have access to the local rails and they have Bitcoin liquidity because they need it for all of their operations. And everyone, of course, lists and, and manages liquidity in Bitcoin. When you put that together, and of course, these are so, just some of the public names. There's a lot more coming onto UMA over the next few months. You'll quickly realize that essentially that infrastructure that was there and dormant and was mostly used for investment, it's going to be extremely important for global payments. That will deliver to consumers and businesses not only lower cost, but also faster speed, right? Because now you can really move value between a real-time domestic system, say in Brazil with PICS, and a different real-time system, maybe in the UK. All of that is possible once you use Bitcoin as kind of the bridge between these different countries. And and costs are only going to come down as the network grows. So today, most Bitcoin trading, without going too much into the weeds, is still mostly happening at the OTC level, at the market maker level on layer one, right? But there's no reason that needs to be the case. You could have OTC and market making on lightning where it's real time within seconds or split seconds. When that happens, I think people will realize that not only the cost of Bitcoin liquidity will go down substantially, but the ecosystem will grow by an order of magnitude. And the ETF, you know, whenever it's going to be approved, whether today or later, it's, it's the first bridge between TradFi and crypto at large scale. So I would not underestimate how much that will do for, again, 
reinforcing the fact that Bitcoin is the most important asset with the deepest liquidity in the crypto ecosystem. So a great fit for, for global payments. Amazing. An absolutely fascinating discussion. I agree with you about the possibility of shifting an enormous amount of flow onto the Bitcoin network. And I'm really encouraged by the incredible amount of innovation Bitcoin has seen over the last one or two years, as if you know the pressure from the bear market is making it a hardened place where you can find new diamonds that weren't expected to be there before. So it's a fantastic time to be in the ecosystem as well as revisit the Bitcoin thesis and build around it. Christian, thank you so much for joining me today. If our audience wants to learn more about you or about LightSpark, where should they go? We are at LightSpark on Twitter. I'm C. Catalini on Twitter, or actually I should say X, and LightSpark.com has a lot more information about what we're building. Fantastic. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time. <music>